Wonderful. We are uh, admitting everyone for the Opta Live webinar for BYD. Uh, we are uh, just just past 1.30. Give us a moment to uh, admit folks here and we will get going. Uh, we have over uh, 140, almost 150 participants today, which speaks volumes to the interest uh, in today's session. Uh, just dealing with logistics, uh, we will have everyone in uh, muted uh, at the end of the presentation. There'll be opportunities for Q and A. You can either use the chat or we can can unmute at that time. But again, thank you to everyone who is joining us for the, the BYD Building Electric Bus Infrastructure Today webinar. Uh, this webinar is in place of our regular Ontario Transportation Expo event, which of course has been canceled for the second year in a row, but in lieu of getting together and uh, sharing best practices, we're bringing you Opta Live, and we want to thank our business members who are sponsoring these events and sharing their expertise. Uh, I would like to turn it over to Ted Dowling of BYD for introductions. Thank you very much. Uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity, Karen, to present. And I'm just going to share my screen here. It's always the fun part, right? So yes, we have a wonderful panel today. Um, Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, we have Daniel Carr, head of Smart Cities for Electric Utilities. Uh, we also have uh, Teresa Cook, Vice President of Business Development and Strategies for Seaman. Frederick Garou, um, of uh, Seven Generation Capital, Commercial Vehicle Fleet Electrification. And then Kent Rathwell, uh, World Awarded EV Infrastructure Pioneer Climate Change Disruptor. So give me one second as I start my we can see that. Everybody can see full screen here? Here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about uh, BYD. We are the sponsors, so you'll have to uh, endure this for a little bit. Um, BYD have several different uh, business divisions. Uh, we are commercial uh, vehicles, as well as we manufacture uh, passenger cars. No plan yet to bring those to, uh, to North America. We do have some commercial passenger cars that are here, but not for the consumers. Um, unfortunately, we are winning uh, quite a few awards on that side. Uh, about four or five years ago, we hired Wolfgang Egger from Audi and uh, he's completely, completely revamped the design of our vehicles. And it's been uh, a great uh, thing for us as a, a, a car designer. And uh, with the new blade battery and platform, it's. It's uh, put us in the forefront of vehicle manufacturing and electric vehicle manufacturing in the world. For the energy solutions, that's, uh, that's really our solar panels, our, our batteries. Uh, last year, we uh, delivered over 60 gigawatt hours um, of, of batteries. Um, we build different types of chemistries, but uh, we primarily for the, uh, for the vehicles, we stick with the iron phosphate. Um, we believe it's superior battery for safety and, uh, and it'll last the, the 12 years in your bus. Um, for the electronics or IT division, uh, we work with several different innovative companies in the IT space, uh, not just doing contract manufacturing, but also input on their designs. Uh, we have an office in Silicon Valley. Um, the companies we work with are Apple, Google, Samsung, and, uh, and Microsoft, to name a few. Last year, we shipped over 70 million consumer electronic devices. Uh, odds are you have one in your house or you've, heard, you've used one in the, in the past. Uh, Motorola uh, Razor was our first phone we did. Uh, Hello Moto was one of the best selling cell phones in the world. Um, ultimately, our, our core competence is uh, the company uh, throughout our products is the high volume and high precision manufacturing. On the SkyRail side, we, we recently um, won an award or won a, uh, a, I guess, the ability to negotiate with uh, LA County for their next uh, uh, mass transit deployment. So that's, uh, that's one thing we're really excited about. And of course, on the commercial vehicles, of which everyone knows is the uh, fork trucks, the uh, buses, as well as the electric uh, heavy duty trucks as well. 
In 2014, we opened our facility in California to build buses. We expanded to 550,000 square feet recently, and we continue to expand for other, uh, other buildings, batteries, and uh, potentially SkyRail as well in California. 2019, we uh, opened our new market facility in, uh, in Ontario. This was to meet the Canadian content requirements. Uh, we created over 30 jobs there, uh, as well as other offshoot jobs where we purchased our windows direct from Winnipeg from the manufacturer. Ramps came from Quebec. Uh, the uh, mirrors came from Oakville. So we really tried to uh, make this a Canadian, uh, Canadian venture. We have the largest selection of electric buses under one brand. Um, and with that, you know, we have the largest selection of buses that have passed Altoona as well, which is a requirement in a lot of the uh, bids that are out today for electric vehicles being procured. So as, as with everybody's electric bus, there are, are all different applications. So obviously the airport on the commercial side, uh, we also have the transportation, the agencies, um, universities, and then on the corporate and tourism side, a lot of people don't realize, but you have uh, vehicles operating in, um, at, by, owned by companies that are actually taking the employees to work uh, every day and they, they get off the BART, for example, in California, get in a nice reclined air conditioned bus and they uh, are able to do their work right away. It's got full Wi-Fi. So they start getting paid as soon as they get on the, on the uh, bus itself. And on the uh, commercial truck side, we're, which we'll, we'll kind of jump into a little bit here uh, in hopefully in some of these presentations of combining networks and, and infrastructure to, uh, to charge multiple uh, different, whether it's buses or, or your commercial fleets at your cities. So we want to be able to focus on being able to charge on all of, all of those uh, infrastructures. So we have anything from class eight to class six and, and the terminal ports trucks, uh, which is our, our 8Y shunt truck, all the way to the refuse in class eight and six as well. So when we talk about electric buses, they're always, always the cleanest. This is a study that was done by the Union of Concerned Scientists and really it, it shows the battery electric is the, is the best, even with the mixed grid in the United States, it's still the cleanest way to transport people. Um, I like to bring this up as a really good example of, of some of the things that you see buses that are operating in Canada. We, we tend to keep our buses a little bit longer than in other uh, developed countries. So we have buses operating in Canada that are EPA engines of 2004 and older. So 2007, 2004, 2004, 2.4, it's one of the worst emitting engines that you see out there today, the Detroit diesel engines, that type of thing. Those who operate them know what I'm talking about. Um, we have about 16,000 plus heavy duty transit buses in Canada. Of those, 93% are diesel. So, you know, CNG was that wonder fuel was supposed to take over and it really hasn't taken over at all. In some places in California, for example, they, they mandated it, but other places it just wasn't, uh, just didn't, didn't take on. So of those 15,000 plus, there's uh, 22% are, are still operating. So there's still 3,500 uh, 2004 EPA engines operating in Canada. Those are the worst emitters. Those are the ones we should target to replace now. They should, there should be legislation put in place to get them off the road today. So these, of these the EPA 2004 and 2007s, you need to get those off the road now. Um, because if you look at the emissions, they, they produce this, this the 75% uh, of the emissions. Now, people may ask why, why are we operating these older buses? Well, they're actually easier to operate, they're cheaper to operate than the, uh, than the other vehicles. And you'll see in some places, some transit authorities are actually retiring their 2011 buses instead and keeping their older ones and operating them. So, uh, so what's it going to take? And in, in China, it took policy incentives uh, for the buses and the infrastructure, and then they removed the incentives, and still they're purchasing. They're they're mandated to uh, replace all diesel buses. Now they have three million at that point, so three hundred thousand is only ten percent. Um, in Europe, it's policy and incentives. They have uh, the European. Each country has their own policies, and then they they put the uh, the funding down to the the municipalities, the cities. Uh, in South America, there's policy and government, and they also have uh, the private equity and utility is involved. In fact, in Chile, the utility own the, own the buses and they lease them to the, uh, the operators. So there's always new ways to look at how we can do this. Um, and then I, I, I bring this one up because it's interesting. You know, four years ago, there was uh, four electric bus manufacturers. You know, 
ne next year, they're, they're, or now there's actually another, another six. So that's 10. Um, next year, there could be another five. And who knows after that, what's gonna happen? This is all electric bus manufacturers that are looking at our market today. So going from four to 20 in a matter of two or three years, that's pretty incredible. It just shows you the trend that's happening for electric vehicles and uh, where we're at today. So with that, I'd like to uh, go into uh, introduce Daniel Carr, who will be our first speaker. He's head of uh, Smart Cities for Electric Utilities. A little bit of background. So he's a project manager uh, with expertise in energy program development and management, policy development and regulatory strategy. Um, he graduated with his master's from Carleton University and also went to, um, where is that other one? Cornell University in the US. So without further ado, here is Daniel Carr. Thank you very much. I'll just get my uh, screen up here. Let me know if that comes up okay. Can you see me there? Yeah, you're good to go. Wonderful, okay. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ted. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Daniel Carr, uh, head of the Smart Cities team at Electric Utilities in our Great Centre. Uh, and uh, being in the Great Centre, um, our focus is really on exploring innovation, both in terms of technology and business models. And so electric mobility is certainly an area where we uh, have a lot, of, a lot of opportunity to explore those topics. And so um, right now we, we are looking at a broad range of applications in the electric mobility field um, from you know, early stage technology research and exploration uh, investigation to make sure we understand what's going on in the market um, through to you know, demonstration projects where you have an opportunity to actually test technology and, and apply in practice with, with actual customers to see how the technology works. And then following that, we, we carry it forward into uh, commercial deployment. So working on the, the strategy element of how this fits within our, our corporate uh, goals and strategy to then deploy uh, in, a, uh, in a real life market environment. So um, I'd like to share with you today some of the work that we've done in those areas and uh, some considerations as to how um, uh, it relates to e-mobility with respect to buses. Um, so I'll take just a brief moment uh, to talk about Electra. Then um, given the nature of Electra being both a uh, regulated utility and an energy services company. Um, I have some thoughts I can share on both the regulated side and the commercial side. So just briefly, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Electra is a, um, is a relatively new company formed in the past five years as a, as a result of mergers of various um, municipally owned uh, utility companies, as well as their uh, affiliated uh, energy services companies. So we now are the largest municipally owned utility in Canada, um, second largest in North America, uh, serving over a million customers in the GTA. And uh, what that really means is that we've got a, a, the opportunity to have economies of scale in terms of the services that we offer and, uh, and we serve a diverse customer base. So we have the opportunity to serve you know, rural remote locations as well as uh, dense urban environments and everything in between. Uh, our CEO, Brian Bentz, really sees the opportunity for us as technology evolves and as we um, have the opportunity through, you know, the, the changes impacting not just the energy sector, but also society in general in terms of uh, reducing carbon emissions, uh, new technologies impacting um, the grid that, gives, that give customers more ability to play a role in the energy market and uh, to have more choice. Um, that that provides a, a challenge to us as a company because there's you know customers have more ability it's not just a matter of uh, of us being a utility and you know uh, making sure the lights stay on and that's that's the end of the relationship but it really provides a much uh, deeper opportunity for us to to be involved to participate with our customers to understand what their needs are and to help bring them solutions so we really see um the opportunity for us to be our customers energy ally is a really uh, important and uh, rewarding challenge and e-mobility is a really excellent uh, example of this. And so we've been involved in this field for a decade, uh, recognizing the opportunities that it brings to us. And so I won't go through all these things, but I did want to highlight just a few things along our roadmap of, of activity of the past uh, decade. Uh, highlighting first off our work with municipalities, uh, given that we are municipally owned, we do have strong relationships with our, uh, with our communities. And so we have a number of different projects that we've undertaken in the past few years uh, 
whether they be uh, the installation of uh, fast charging stations in Barrie, uh, whether they're, it's a, uh, our workplace charging project at the city of Markham where we're, we're testing some advanced technology and uh, working with the city to support their fleet needs as well. Um, and also providing charging stations in the residential context where it's the the business models might be a little bit uh, more complicated but no less important given the fact that most individuals charge their electric vehicles at home so um, a broad range of activities there another thing that i really like to draw your attention to is the work we've done with brampton transit on their uh, e-bus journey uh, they're one of the first uh, actors in this field in Ontario and and they're you know, well along the journey now and really poised for for future growth so we've been uh, involved with them since they first installed the charging stations for the first pilot a number of years ago uh, with just a few charging stations and now as they look to to rapidly expand over the next couple of years we're looking to uh, support the uh, the low growth on that side as well. So I'll just talk a little bit about the from the utilities perspective what uh, what the e mobility um, looks like from there. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think, uh, you know, one of the things to think about is from a utility, you know, a transit facility might just look the same as anything else, right? You know, we, uh, you know, from a transformer load, whether they, uh, you know, the utility doesn't necessarily um, have, uh, in, you know, the, uh, the need to know about every single thing that's going on on the customer site. But when it comes to transit, these projects are not like, you know, any, any other typical customers. Um, for one thing, the projects can be extremely large and, uh, and there's a high need for reliability as well. Uh, this is, you know, an essential municipal service that's being provided. So it's, it's really important that we make sure that we provide that, um, that reliability and that, um, that service. And so, as I mentioned, we've been involved in these types of projects for a number of years, and we've also been trying to get expertise, um, you know, in our own activities, on our, in our own, you know, uh, playing fields, make sure that we understand these things on our own side. So uh, we've been looking at doing things like fleet electrification of our own uh, light duty vehicles and now looking more seriously at, uh, at the, you know, heavier duty vehicles like our bucket trucks that we have. We did explore some of this work uh, about five years, five years ago, looking at hybrids, we found that the, the technology wasn't there yet, but obviously the technology is rapidly evolving and we are looking forward to uh, taking electric bucket trucks in the next few years. Um, so we'll have both light duty and heavy duty vehicles in our fleet. Uh, we also offer workplace charging for our uh, employees so that we are encouraging the, the adoption of e-mobility and, and really understanding, you know, what changes as you go from two to five to 10 to, you know, a hundred uh, charging stations in a facility and the needs that come with, uh, whether it's uh, resiliency, whether it's load control, whether it's just the, the ability to offer a, like an energy service in a way that hasn't been uh, provided before. And, um, and so as we do that, we can also look at the system impacts, understanding, you know, from our facilities, what sort of, um, low profile and challenges that we have in terms of like how, how controllable the load is and that sort of thing. How can we apply that to, um, other customers that are applying these um, at, at their own facilities. So we're trying to learn from that example and, and uh, understand what's happening in our own backyard. And as we do so, we're also looking forward to how we can adapt because, you know, as I mentioned, transit loads are not the same as every other load uh, that we serve. Uh, and so there's a couple areas where we see that there could be, you know, challenges or changes that are required over time. So um, some of the things that we want to be aware of are, um, you know, wh what the role is for the utility, because this is um, a new area and, and the regulatory environment doesn't necessarily keep up with, uh, with technology as, uh, as quickly as we might hope. And so, you know, what that appropriate role is for the utility, how involved we ought to be, how we mitigate things like technology risk where, um, you know, maybe a certain type of charging stations put in for an e-bus fleet and then five years down the road it turns out that maybe that's not the right technology and that uh, you know the, the the type of buses that were expected are different and maybe we don't need so much on route charging and we need more depot charging um, if the utility makes that investment how do we how do we make sure that we're not sort of left holding the uh, the investments that have been made to serve that customer's need um, another consideration is where where we are um, in terms of the funding um, you know, the, the chain of funding. So are we expected to be receiving funding and, and building based on that? Are we expecting to provide funding to our customers? Um, you know, wh where exactly uh, do we fit in there? And then finally, in terms of the connection process, is there, uh, is there something different that we need to do based on the, the, uh, uh, the types of loads that these are and the, the timelines and that sort of thing, uh, making sure that, you know, 
if if a community has made a commitment that they want to have you know 50 electric buses hitting the road in two years are we ready to meet that challenge and um, are there different ways of doing business that we have to uh, consider to make sure that we aren't uh, aren't the ones that are uh, holding back uh, a transit company's desires to put more e-buses on the road looking at it now from the uh, from the commercial side of things uh, we have been involved um, in the past couple of years looking to deploy charging stations for uh, workplaces and for uh, public charging and um, recognizing that you know there's the sort of chicken and the egg question of whether the the, the charging infrastructure needs to be there first or the adoption needs to be there first so uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, contributing to um, that sort of customer comfort with adopting e-mobility and so uh, we're working with our municipal shareholders and some commercial facilities facilities as well to provide that infrastructure um, but the one thing that's different with when you, when it comes to buses is that sort of build it and they will come is not necessarily uh, the way it's going to go uh, with transit you can't just kind of put some charging stations out there and expect that a, an electric bus is going to show up the next day in the same way that you might um, say okay we're going to put in some charging infrastructure and you know two years down the road you know people are going to having seen that infrastructure are be more comfortable buying it you know it's really um much more of a, a you know the transit company and the municipality's decision as to whether they want to electrify and so we need to be having those discussions with those those actors in particular to make sure that we are uh, providing the infrastructure that's required um, and a lot, lot more planning uh, you know the, the loads are bigger and and um, it's a more complex service than it would be for you know installing some level two or even level three charging stations at a facility So uh, when it comes to transit, uh, we we recognize that buying the bus is the easy part. You know, you come up with uh, you know a million, million and a half dollars, you can buy a bus. But in terms of all the work that needs to go into actually making sure that that bus is on the road, that it's uh, properly staffed, that it's maintained, that all the planning's been done, so that that reliability will be there uh, over the course of of the lifespan. That's a, a much bigger jump, and especially as you go from a two bus pilot to a, you know a, a you know ten bus deployment to then you know looking to go uh, net zero over the next twenty years. It sounds like a long time, but it's not really a long time. I think most of the people on this call will recognize uh, that's the case, and so we want to make sure that we're not just trying to provide the energy service and saying, okay, well we've done our uh, our part, and you know that that's all that's required, but really understanding that there's a a much broader uh, range of services that need to need to be provided uh, to to transit facilities and, and transit operators so that they can feel comfortable and have confidence in how they move forward. And so we really see ourselves as being part of that solution process, uh, bringing forward the energy services. Uh, you know, we have um, part among our services include uh, distributed energy resources like storage and and on site generation uh, and load management. Uh, you know, all those sorts of like fancy energy services but really who else do we need to bring into the conversation to make sure we understand okay what is that what does the route look like uh you know what are all those different considerations of how an electric bus is, uh the considerations of what type of bus to buy and how much energy needs to be provided when and where um all those different questions that need to be thought through so we're looking to work with partners to help our our um, municipal um, partners and the transit agencies to make the right decision and with that, I will wrap up my presentation. Happy to take questions uh, later on, Ted, when uh, when the time is right. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was excellent. Yeah, we'll do the questions at the end for sure. Um, all right. So now next we have is uh, Teresa Cook. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, being on the board of Electric Mobility Canada with uh, Teresa. But Teresa also leads the uh, strategic and business development for Siemens Canada, uh, special focus uh, uh, growing, growing Siemens charging infrastructure business. Her Siemens career started uh, in management consulting in the US and Germany, uh, led her to offshore wind in Denmark, and then back to Canada for st her strategic uh, strategy roles across Siemens energy businesses. Uh, she holds uh, a bunch of degrees from uh, Waterloo and uh, also uh, a doctorate in neuroscience. So welcome Dr. Teresa Cook. Here, I'll pass it on to you now. Thanks Ted and hi everyone. Okay, let me share my screen here. And it's great to be with you two on, on the boards and lots of lots of great dialogue. So thank you for being such a great part of the community. 
Okay, so the the tooth fairy came to our house this week and uh, she brought my daughter a Lego set, Lego Friends, for those of you who are in the know for Lego Friends in that age group of girls. Um, and the Lego Friends set is has an EV in it. It's an EV charging Lego set. So, you know, note to any of you out there who have girls in the age of six to 10, cool gift. Um, and so she, Tooth Fairy got this and my daughter's super excited. And she's like, look, mom, it's like what you do at work, you know? And she builds the car and it's super cool. And then she's like, look, I'm gonna show you how it charges. So I'm, I'm like, yeah, okay, how does it charge? It plugs into the wind turbine. And I'm like, that just made me laugh because you know, that's kind of reflective of where we're at, like Dan was saying. The vehicle, we get it, it's pretty okay. When we go to plug it into something, is like, what does this thing plug into? We haven't even really thought it through. I mean, I, we're making progress, but I still think it's just kind of funny that, you know, the mental model is, oh, let's just plug it into whatever's generating the power. Great, done, right? So um, then preparing for this talk, it was great, we were chatting with Ted and, and he kind of like threw down the gauntlet at me and said, well, Teresa, just explain, you know, why it's easy. Like, it's easy to do e-bus infrastructure today. So, you know, just explain that. And I was thinking, yeah, that's actually, that's a great point and that's a great challenge. Um, and yet I was really struggling with that a little bit. And that's why I wrote this title on this presentation is, is, is it easy or not today? Um, and, and so, you know, the quick answer uh, is that I think I can give you honestly today is it's easier than it has ever been, uh, but there's still some challenges. So that's when I'm gonna invite you to come with me now on this little journey through why is building charging infrastructure easier than it's ever been before? And what's still challenging and what are the solutions on the horizon? So this is my Letterman moment, um, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the irony. So mine, mine is not ironic, but it's my top 10. My top 10 reasons that charging infrastructure is easier than ever before. Um, as of 5 a.m. this morning. So number one, early adopters are paving the way. And be that, you know, all the way back to Hamburg 2015 when we installed our first overhead charger, we've been learning since that point. Then in 2017, we did uh, Cité Mobilité in Montreal. And so since that point, we started learning. And then we've done depot charging in uh, airports across Canada. And, and all of us, right, not, not just Siemens, but all the players and stakeholders are learning and are paving the way in the initial projects, um, you know, globally, but especially here in Canada. Number two, installation and commissioning processes are maturing a lot. And I'm seeing that day to day in our business from, you know, 18 months ago to today, the projects, the maturity, uh, the, the understanding amongst all the stakeholders is is vastly improved the interoperability standards are maturing so you know from a transit perspective i would say you know you just want the bus and the charger to just work together seamlessly we all know that right now and especially in the early days of the projects that that reality is not is there especially when we talk about overhead charging because the standards simply don't tell us how to do it um, and then there's so many different little things that can just, it's a dance of software between these two entities and one little thing can just, you know, start hitting a threshold and boom, not working. So what we really need is the standards to finish maturing so that all the major use cases that we need are covered. The fourth reason it's easier today is that we have experienced local service capabilities growing in all the major you know, cities across Canada. And that's a huge, huge undertaking, um, as well as a big investment. And that's something that we all need to be aware of that that's kind of a collective investment that we're making. And also a reason that we need this market to scale because it's only when the market purchasing will scale that the service supply chain will follow that and thus ensure the reliability at scale. Number five, um, Charger manufacturing capacity is scaling. So we're scaling up in, in North America so that we can get faster delivery. We can get all of our questions done in the same time zone. We have really good leverage on all of our colleagues locally. 
So, and these, this is happening across the board. I and mean, we need that because once the volume starts to hit, we're going to need that capacity and those lead times. More flexible solution architectures are rolling out, right? So we're seeing different options in terms of, do you decentralize the charging strategy? Do you centralize the charging strategy? What are the approaches? Um, how modular, you know, can you stack units? What does it mean? Like, what is your cabling, um, you know, can you easily move the cabling? Can you use bus bar trunking? So all these different kinds of solution architectures are going to make it a lot easier to deploy. Um, like Dan said, utilities, both the regulated and the deregulated sides are activating. And that is very, very good because these are critical energy assets. And we have to have the utilities at the table uh, for this to be successful. And one can even argue for an even greater role of the regulated utility in this space. But we have to all understand that today that's not, you know, that's not possible. But maybe that's something that we all should be pushing for to have a greater role of regulated utility. Simulation capabilities are improving. So we're now able, you know, there's all the root studies, all of that capability is improving, more stakeholders are able to perform those services. And then the simulation of the depot charging, because this is a, you know, a mathematical problem to be optimized with, you know, AI and statistical regression and all those tools, right? We need to know what are the different use cases, what's going to happen, what do we need to predict in terms of all of the different energy assets and the charging performance so that we can optimize the, the capex and the opex? Nine, a clear roadmap for the feed stage now exists, and I'm going to show it to you in, in another slide. And number 10 is just all of us here now. Like there's 102 people in this call right now. And you know, this is the Ontario community of people who want to make this happen, who are invested in making this happen. And us together is one of the main reasons that this is going to be easier and is easier than ever before. So I just want to point out that, you know, one way we want to make it easier for you is to be the expert on the energy system. And we can provide those solutions from end to end um, or just pieces, the pieces that you need. So we can do the supplies um, and simulation because that's core business for us for, for you know, utilities and power systems. We can look at the charger configuration and what the optimal layout is. We can look at the installation and the interoperability testing and how that should work. Obviously the hardware solutions, the chargers, AC and DC, the low and medium voltage power distribution, the storage elements, the microgrid controller itself, and then the, the software and the service that's needed. Um, so we're very flexible, but what I mean is that there are stakeholders that can you can reach out to and get a vast amount of knowledge on multiple topics in one fell swoop. We're also learning a lot because we have now over 40 high powered fleet chargers installed across Canada. And that's why it's easier now than it was before we had this installed base. And the bigger this installed base gets, the easier and easier it's going to be to do the next project. So I promised you a simple three-step roadmap. Um, and so this is kind of the basic three steps if you want to optimize the energy portion of the depot. So number one, you need to do the root study to figure out, okay, what is going to be the load um, on, of the vehicles that I'm going to need to charge? Then you need to see how, what are my options for, for actually meeting that load? What are all of the different variations that can happen throughout the day? What kind of losses do I have? And understand what's the right configuration of, of charging. And then you have kind of an optimized load, which is like once I've, you know, once I've kind of shaved it off and shifted it, how what what does that optimized hopefully lower load curve looking like lower peak and then you need to look at okay how do i serve that load what are all what are all the needs that i'm going to have what kind of power quality needs am i going to have what kind of um, interconnection capacity issue am i am i dealing with what's my rate structure um, and you know what's my building load are there adjacent loads that i might want to be planning for and, you know we've been talking about kind of 
how do you plan at a municipal location, which might not just be the transit buses, but might also be some other types of vehicles, or maybe sharing a backup generator with a nearby, you know, other kind of facility, right? So how do I optimize the local energy system? And that's a third component of the study. So that's why I think it's easy. And why I think it is still challenging is uh, three main reasons. Number one, procurements are taking a long time. Um, and I, I'm curious on your thoughts on this, and I'd love to have a bit of a dialogue in, in the Q&A. Uh, but for us, the, the challenge, and maybe you know, for many of the OEMs, is that it's a global resource game, right? So if Canada takes too long to ramp up, the resources, global resource allocation in the companies will go to other places. So we really need to, like, we don't have to have crazy growth, but we have to have solid momentum and growth in order to jointly keep progressing and keep, um, keep building on what we've got. So how can we solve this? And these are just a few suggestions from my side. Number one, I see the beginnings of joint procurement initiatives, and I think that's great, especially for a smaller transit that may not have the expertise. Um, how can the transit agencies come together? And here, Opta is an amazing forum for that to bundle their expertise. Um, involving the utility, super, super important. Um, and then regular technology updates from us. And I'd say, you know, we don't need an RFI to provide you information. We can just provide you information um, whenever you want. And, and we can do that regularly because our innovation cycles are happening so fast that if we don't talk often enough, we might not be able, you might not be getting the optimal solution. So that is why I'm calling it an agile approach. Um, secondly, the funding gap is not closed. So, you know, I, I think for the buses, it's pretty clear and CIB is there and you, there's the gas tax money and so on to fund the, the extra cost for the bus. But for the charging infrastructure, we know Infrastructure Canada got a program, but details are a bit, are still TBD. Um, another solution element can be a charging as a service business model, where really it's taking you know, that, that big, heavy capex off of the shoulders of the transit. And I'm very curious to better understand what are the obstacles or the questions relative to charging as a service um, for you and your transit. And then finally, I think, my, just my observation, but I, I also am looking forward to your feedback, is a gap in infrastructure deployment expertise at the transit agency. So would it make sense to perhaps create like a joint project management office across multiple smaller transit agencies to be able to have that expertise and share it across multiple electrification projects. Because even if you get a third party, you still have to control that third party, right? You're still gonna need some expertise in-house to control the, the, the third party stakeholder. And then finally, um, training programs. I think this is a whole new field emerging, which I'll come to on my next slide. And how do we skill ourselves as the leaders and then all of the people around us to really be able to adequately deliver all of these projects? So as I said, it, you know, I think a big challenge for us is that this is a new field of expertise. This is unconscious incompetence, you know, and we have to be fluent in three languages, which is fleet operations, electrical, and digital. And I think you know, there's very few of us who are, who are already gurus in all three, right? So we have to figure out how do we close the gaps um, for all different levels and how do we create a whole new generation of talent that is fluent in these languages? And so we're gonna be doing an Opta Live session and we're gonna be talking with community colleges exactly about that topic and how we can create that workforce for Ontario. Just closing, you know, I think the bottom line is to really be successful, we're gonna to have to have new ways of working together. And those new ways are going to have to be agile and they're gonna to have to be multidisciplinary. And I really look forward to being part of it with you. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Teresa. I should point out you're also the, uh, the chair of our heavy duty, medium duty working group uh, with the EMC as well. So thank you for that. Um, and next uh, we go on to Frederick, uh, Dojo, I hope I got that right. Dojo, sorry. Um, Frederick uh, is uh, he graduated from the University Engineering for uh, Ecole Centrale de Lille in France. 
If you haven't been to Lille, it's one of the prettiest cities in France. A uh, really short uh, trip to Bruges or in Belgium if you wanted to go there. Um, he uh, served in the automotive and transportation industries for 25 years, uh, in the electromobility industry since 2010. Uh, he contributed to the development of EV ecosystems at Renault Cars, then developed electric bus projects for Novabus and managed electric and hydrogen trucks integration projects at Dana. So welcome, uh, Frederick, with seventh generation. This is a different uh, kind of approach looking at how we could bring in private capital, private uh, equity into uh, in bus infrastructure in Canada. Thank you very much, uh, Ted. So good afternoon and thank you for having me here. So um, as you said, I've been working um, for many years in the electric uh, vehicle sector, including the electric bus development. And I'm happy to be here uh, today with the Ontario Public Transit Association. Uh, and today my main occupation is to help fleet managers to switch to electric. And, um, uh, and so as you said, I'm director of operations at uh, Seven Generation Capital. So uh, does it work? Oh, yeah. So the mission of Seven Generation Capital is to provide a turnkey solution for commercial vehicle fleet electrification to address all the different aspects of this transition and all the activities that will be needed. It goes from a clear assessment of operations to the project definition, the system procurement and installation, and also includes the maintenance services, the connected services, and very important, uh, the financial support that seven generation capital can bring by proposing a leasing scheme on vehicles and charging systems. And I already saw in the chat that we had a question about funding and that's really something uh, seven gen capital brings uh, to, to, to help uh, the, the whole process. So this is really a full bundle of services to address all that is needed to electrify your fleet. Um, on the vehicle side, 2021 is really a pivotal year on commercial vehicle electrification with many trucks that will be introduced coming from main OEMs, also newcomers for, to the industry. And this is only the beginning. Many trucks are announced in 2022. This is definitely a good time to consider electric trucks. So at Seven Generation Capital, we propose now leasing offers on a wide range of vehicles. So we work for last mile delivery with vans, step vans, box trucks. We also deliver municipal services with shuttles, uh, school buses, re refuse trucks. We also address the logistics needs with yard, yard trucks and summit traders. And we basically work with all the main players of the market. On the transit bus side, as you know, the vehicles have been here for many years now, uh, as Ted mentioned before. And several OEMs are now proposing their products, which have been tested through pilot projects, and their performance has been already well established. We are now at this stage where transit authorities are ramping up and are preparing procurement on the large scale. So wherever you are on your EV journey, seven generation capital can help. You may consider partial or full electrification of your fleet, but in every case, you want to go through all of these steps from planning vehicle replacement, consulting on vehicle selection and system sizing, depending on operational needs, procuring the vehicle and systems, and going through project phase, permitting, installation, commissioning, up to running operations and maintenance. Seven Gen can guide you through the maze of electrification solutions and help you implement them. So I want to insist on the advantages of going through infrastructure leasing. On the purchasing scheme, you will need to hire the experts to manage the transition. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what that, that was, was mentioned by, by Daniel. Uh, we, we need a lot of, of expertise to, 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 to do this. You will also need significant capex investment to get organized also and staffed for maintenance and get the right partners. And you will also, uh, it will be a one-time sale, sale with a limited relationship with the suppliers. With leasing relationships comes a full package that includes the expertise, the contribution of already identified and selected partners, the financing that spreads the upfront cost onto the operations, and also a full support along the whole life cycle that will not leave you alone in case anything happens. So as you may know, there was a recent report regarding the city of Edmonton published by the Canada Infrastructure Bank. 
And this is a very interesting uh, report where it's mentioned that Canada Infrastructure Bank is offering financing through their zero emission bus program to enable cities to borrow the upfront cost difference between the a zero emission bus and a conventional diesel bus. So for a total cost of $27 million with $12.6 million reallocated from the existing fleet and $14.4 million of debt financing from the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, the city can purchase 20 electric buses to replace diesel buses reaching their end of life. Currently, the upfront cost difference, which is approximately $722,000 uh, with a diesel bus costing 628000 and an electric bus costing $1.35 million, um, can be bring, so this upfront cost can be bring by the Canadian Infrastructure uh, Bank. And the report mentions that borrowed amounts will be repaid with savings from lower operating costs of the electric buses compared to diesel buses. And it also states that Canada Infrastructure Bank will take the risk of loan repayment if overall actual savings are less than the forecasted amount expected on the entire period. So that's a very interesting approach that shows how leasing uh, on vehicles and infrastructure can help transit authorities switch to electric with the same capex and opex as diesel. So. Our goal at 7Gen is to meet all the requirements of a successful public-private cooperation by managing the risks on the entire life cycle, offering the best solution as a technology agnostic player independent from su suppliers, leveraging innovative solutions, design to cost, TCO approach and project methodologies, 7Gen brings its expertise over long-term leasing scheme that lowers uncertainty on costs and amortize them on the whole life cycle. So how we can help today the transit industry is by obviously applying our leasing scheme to the e-bus charging infrastructure implementation. Also, in the, we, we know that in the past COVID context of transit operations, uh, by bringing the funding that is missing because of ridership decrease, but we can also propose new solutions, such as the opportunity to downsize the vehicles with leased shuttles that could be providing on-demand mobility services, food for thought. So before the conclusion, I would like to give you an overview of our vision of scalability and planning regarding charging infrastructure. When you electrify a fleet, it's, it's important to consider a longer term target of full electrification, which could drive the decision of potentially upgrading the grid connection power. Also cons lead to consider the pre-installation of wiring to anticipate the future extension uh, to the whole fleet. Also design a charging system that uh, allows to later scale uh, the, to a higher number of electric vehicles with the flexibility to address different charging power uh, needs amongst vehicles. And of course, during this analysis, an option of local renewable energy production or storage can also be considered. So on the longer term, this electrification planning will be more efficient than an incremental approach that could lead to several expensive installations and dismantlings uh, that could be avoided by a good plan. So I want to conclude this presentation by saying that uh, seven generation capital is ready today to outline the scope of your project and help you build and implement your electrification roadmap. So thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you, Frederic. Appreciate that. Uh, the, the private uh, private money in public transit is uh, something that's been done before and it can continue to happen. So it was great. Uh, but now I bring next to us uh, Kent Rathwell. Uh, if you don't know Kent, um, he is a 30 year mission. He's been focused on planting seeds to, to disrupt uns unsustainable global models. I could go through a couple more things, but I'll just say in 2012, he fund funded and the free charging across all Canada and North America to provide the EV so that you can travel EVs across the nation and the entire continent for free. Um, this was the Trans-Canada Highway, Sun Country Highway, and this is Kent Rathwell. Kent, you there? He's here. Uh, I'm here. Okay. And I know you're going to try to share your screen. I am. Yeah, one second here. The file is pretty big, but uh, it should work here.
you know what? I, I am having issues. So I, I, good thing you sent it to me. So exactly, always a backup. Where is it? Right, just one second. I've got it right here. There, perfect. So when can you see it now? Is that okay? I want to do this. Is that full screen or? Yeah, that, that works, Ted. Okay. So Perfect. You just say okay at the end of it and I'll forward it on. All right. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you everyone for, um, um, for joining and uh, thank you, Ted, for, uh, for having me. Um, you know, uh, long story short, uh, about 30 years ago, I realized uh, studying civil engineering that, um, you know, the way that we designed our cities and, um, and our transportation sector and our energy sector and the list goes on, it was, you know, there wasn't really anything that was economically, socially or environmentally sustainable. And, um, and at that point, I was 19 and I had a, I, I was studying civil engineering, but I also had a aircraft refurbishing company that had like 50 some staff and going 24 seven and doing planes, you know, and jets and whatnot internationally. So it, uh, it was quite a wild ride um, uh, in my post-secondary years. But, um, but you know, um, my, my, uh, my uh, experience goes down to, you know, when I was six, that's when I really had my first business. Um, so I really have a lot of um, a data, I guess you could say, that I've absorbed because um, I've been doing it since I've been about six. And uh, so I feel as though I've lived about five lifetimes. But ultimately, um, you know, in regards to Sun Country Highway, the goal there was just to make sure that, uh, like, I realized that Tesla wasn't installing charging stations. They told me that. And, then, you know, uh, so it was like, uh, well, how are you going to, you know, why would anyone buy your car or a car if there was no place to charge and they couldn't travel in it? So ultimately, when they, you know, they were pretty much out of money. And uh, so I, you know, took a, a half an hour walk around the place and just came back and said, okay, show me what a charger looks like. How does this work? And I'll go down and do something fairly quickly before you guys go out of business. So, so that was really my goal. And, and then within, um, uh, you know, we developed a, a charger really quickly with one of the world's best uh, charging companies that Tesla recommended at that point. And, um, and, uh, and then, yeah, just uh, within a year, the Trans Canada was electrified. All of Vancouver Island was electrified and all of PEI, the first province state or nation really was electrified uh, all in 2012 and and so the shot and then we drove it across the you know across the country uh you know 10,000 kilometers in the middle of a Canadian winter right with that Tesla Roadster to prove that electric cars are fast and sexy they can travel long distances the infrastructure was in across the country and a continent um and and you can travel for free so that was really the goal that was uh, dropping the gauntlet uh, uh to ensure that the electric car survived on a global standard and and our goal was to get a lot of media globally which we had, um, you know, we, we got great support in all different languages and scripts around the world for that initiative. So, but the idea of there was just, just to uh, work with other people to uh, say, this is what we're doing. Uh, we have a deadline, let's get her done. And, uh, and yeah, we had awesome people from all across Canada, from all backgrounds that supported that. So the biggest issue holding back uh, uh, buses um, is, um, is, well, there's a lot of things. There's the processes of acquiring buses, uh, bus barns. Um, you know, and then there's the fact that there's electric buses and the transmission lines aren't up to speed, you know, et cetera. So uh, the idea was to create the most disruptive, most um, uh, sustainable, uh, economically, socially and environmentally sustainable bus burn on the planet and make it a global launch. So uh, to do that, um, you know, we needed something that would work uh, in all countries and um, uh, in all climates and in all situations and, um, and facilities that were scalable so that, um, so that uh, city, as cities expanded, uh, we could expand the facilities and, uh, and then, and then um, be able to save the taxpayer money, save emissions uh, by going say carbon neutral uh, or better than that. And, um, and, and really, you know, try to make society better in those cities. So that's really, uh, really the goal. Okay, next slide, Ted, please. So, um, um, you know, uh, the, um, the idea is flexibility. We can go to the next one, um, uh, Ted. So, you know, it has to be flexible to solve the world's problems. So uh, here's one that uh, we're designing for a um, uh, uh, client. Um, and we'll go to the next one. Okay. Um, and that's with the roof off. Uh, you can see the, the, the maintenance, the, the wash bay, the drive-through and the office area. The, um, um, yeah, so on this one here, you can see um, like a coffee shop over in the, over in the, um, the, the left side of it, you know, for facilities whereby they, they don't mind, uh, you know, inviting the public in, great, you can do it. Otherwise, it's, it's for the facility. But if you have a, a facility of 500 electric buses, then, uh, then you definitely need a coffee shop. Next. 
Um, yeah, so just standard chargers, uh, you know, lots of different ways to format the, the, the bus layouts. Um, okay. Uh, plug-in chargers, overhead chargers, and then um, and then we have inductive charging solutions. All of this is uh, is really uh, agnostic too, right? So uh, next one, please, Ted. Um, you know, so the idea is to uh, work with all companies in all sectors and um, and and really make it charging agnostic and make it bus manufacturer agnostic. Um, so that we can actually really cut to the chase and, and, and get it done. So, um, so we have um, um, not only just bus washes, but we actually do cap carbon capture um, um, and, um, and uh, we, we can make our own soap from that process, right? So again, various technologies that we've integrated. Um, okay, regular maintenance shops. Um, and uh, what makes it a little bit disruptive is the fact that uh, we can actually create, you know, facilities that are that have 100% uh, uh, off-grid uh, electric bus barns. Um, there's advantages to being uh, on the grid. Um, sometimes there's delays to get on the grid. Um, our goal is to be able to uh, provide a, a full turnkey system uh, to a city uh, once the design's set, uh, done um, um, within 12 months um, or as little as 12 months it's turnkey. So, and that could maybe include the buses. So there's various different power generation solutions we have um, to be able to, to solve these problems. Um, again, if, if it was completely off grid, but there's advantages to be in, you know, on grid to help the utilities, um, you know, extend the life of their assets and that lowers everyone's electric, uh, you know, uh, electricity cost per kilowatt. Um, because uh, if, if the grid has to get upgraded or the utility has to do upgrades, well then, then the whole community is gonna be paying for it and okay. Um, so it's just standard, you know, taking, taking uh, you know, traditional power generation and actually extracting the heat out of it and then leveraging that heat for other applications in, in, in the, uh, the bus barn facilities um, for bus barn type operations, as well as beyond the buses, uh, beyond the bus uh, barn um, um, or bus operations. Okay. Standard wind and solar, various different technologies next, um, and kinetic power to allow us to generate the kilowatts, but also uh, to uh, produce air and, um, and, and, and water pumping. So standard um, um, battery storage and, and other types of storage as well, uh, okay. Um, and, um, you know, cold and, and hot thermal storage, but um, this is just, just this really gives you, gives you a taste of what, what, we're, what we're doing. Um, so, uh, you know, microgrids, so, so we, can, we can assist other people locally, or we can actually create bigger hubs, um, which uh, allow uh, uh, all city uh, charging, all fleets, police, you know, this sort of thing, and even the private sector to be able to generate some rev revenue from them uh, to lower the operation cost of the bus, um, uh, bus operations in those, in those cities. Um, so, um, but it goes beyond the utility, right? You know, um, you know, we need to think of, um, of the entire ecosystem on all fronts. And, and that's really, that starts with the power generation plants, their transmission lines, and then into the utilities and then, and then into the cities. And then, and then, um, and then um, obviously um, uh, the facilities and um, or our facilities that we're offering. And, you uh, you know, it's really about um, being able to help the local utility or the system operator uh, balance their load, extend the life of their assets, um, and um, and lower the cost for everybody, not just the the operation of the bus barn. So the standard the standard uh, features for some bus barns, but you know uh, we're, we're throwing in gymnasiums and and a bunch of others that uh, that we can you know offer to them, and um, and 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 more than that. So the the the, the another major disruption. Uh, for e-bus barns is the fact that we can provide um, uh, turnkey solutions uh, for electric bus barn or you know um, um, uh, operators uh, that that include a lot more than just the traditional bus barn, um, and that that you know with that we can provide you know even even a hockey arena in the uh, in the upstairs of the um, in the second level of of our bus barns, um, food food uh, production. Uh, like local food production and uh, homeless shelters uh, without costing the, the, the city um, anymore. Um, so that's sort of, those are sort of bonus features. Uh, so another one is zero waste. It's, it's gathering speed and momentum around the world. And uh, so we definitely tied it into this and, um, you know, um, uh, we'll go with the next one. But ultimately, um, uh, it's really about taking waste streams and, and, and value adding them. 
and I've had a lot of, I've had decades of, of that experience. Um, you know, carbon free water, um, we don't really think of it, but you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we're carbon neutral powered, um, you know, facility. Uh, but you know, the, the bus barns use a lot of water and, um, and 40% of, uh, of Ontario city municipality emissions, non-transportation are actually from water, you know, water, uh, water, uh, treatment, pumping, sewage, sewage treatment, pumping and disposal. Um, so there's a massive study, uh, in Ontario on, um, on how bad the, 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 the water footprint, carbon footprint is, um, in, in municipalities there. And it means it's probably the same everywhere. Uh, okay. Yeah, so um, we also have, um, uh, you know, one of the special things about us is our, is our, is our national and international partners. Um, so we can do a lot of things on site and, uh, and that includes um, repurposing old batteries, but, and, then, and then once they're done, actually recycling them as well, uh, right on site. Um, and solving other issues such as uh, municipal cardboard recycling, next and uh, lowering costs of their uh, food waste recycling, their tire waste uh, on site, you know, um, and these are all just options are, you know, again, food waste. Um, a lot of cities are having issues with composting. I know like, uh, you know, um, Calgary and Edmonton, you know, their facilities were $100 million a pop, right? So anything we can do with our, our facilities to, to be able to lower other costs to the taxpayer, um, because, uh, um, you know, they're, they're paying for, for all of the, the bus operations in, in Canada, typically with municipalities. Um, and, then, and, then, and then we can also deal with the city sewage issue uh, uh, on site as well. You know, again, it takes it way beyond, obviously, the, you know, our program is a la carte. It's not turnkey. You know, they all won't have all this. But, um, but cities' uh, sewage issues are, are, you know, sewage sludge issues are a problem. And, uh, and they are an environmental hazard. And, they're, and most of them are putting it on farmland. And, and, um, and the liabilities uh, to that in the future are, are, are off the charts, right? With the heavy metals and botulism and, you know, this type of stuff. So if we can solve that problem for the cities on site and it doesn't really cost them anything to do it, then awesome. Um, yeah, and then, and, then, um, and then our carbon program ties into um, parks that we uh, put outside the cities um, and, th and, then, uh, and then measure the amount of carbon that we're sequestering at those parks uh, to the operation of the bus fleets as well. So that, that, that's where we can go beyond just sort of carbon neutral solutions um, and allowing the public to, to actually experience these locations and actually know that their, their city buses are definitely different. Um, so we basically plug in, we measure and we, we plunk the carbon emissions, right? So next. Um, so there's uh, obviously intellectual and, and competitive advantages, uh, uh, not just because this is a, a bus, a charger, and a power generation uh, uh, solution with a, with a structure. It actually goes way beyond that, but it's the integration uh, and with international partners that can expand um, at, at the speed that we expect um, to, uh, to really all come together. And, uh, and again, you know, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not all exclusive. Um, again, it's, it's mainly the bus, the bus manufacturers, um, um, you know, we'll work with them all. Charging manufacturers, we'll work with them all. But our goal is to lower the costs for municipal fleets and uh, lower the carbon emissions and make the community better. And, um, and, and, and it's really that simple. So that's, that's our mission. Um, so we have the economic advantages, very disruptive, very disruptive social advantages with the program. Um, and, uh, and, and ridiculously disruptive environmental advantages. Again, all of this because we go beyond just the bus operations in the city to be able to um, solve a lot of other issues to lower property taxes. And you won't hear it much from uh, mayors or councillors. Uh, I've dealt with a lot for, for decades, um, but uh, typically, you know, they, they just add the, the, the added expense annually, but, you know, we need to stop it because that's why cities are not going to be sustainable in the future. And that's, you know, that was my vision and epiphany 30 years ago was that the old people will be forced out of cities because they won't be able to afford the property taxes. Businesses will be forced out of cities because they cannot afford the property taxes. So we need to do a lot more in our cities than just um, you know, assume that we can increase taxes 3% or 5% every year. Um, so our, our global auditing, auditing um, uh, partners um, will, uh, that standard um, it will be, will go beyond um, uh, fiscal national government auditing standards um, so that we can go above and beyond. So that's already in place. Um, next. And uh, yeah, so what makes this disruptive? Everything. Um, you know, uh, lower costs, like the, the, the carbon uh, negative emissions uh, or neutral emissions, 
uh, the technologies, the partners, the integrations, the, the flexibility of designs. And, and you know, our, our design is, is set so that if the city does need to move the facility in, in, in you know, 20, 30 years, because some developers offering them a gazillion dollars for the land, we actually can do that with that with 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 our with our package. So that's that's been integrated in so that we can actually uh, uh, move these. And uh, and I'm, I'm from the real estate sector as well. Uh, many years ago in investment sector, we did a lot of international investing. So it's about being able to take advantage of that. And hey, if you could sell your land for a gazillion dollars, then then great, that's good for the taxpayer. But our speed, again, we can um, offer uh, turnkey solutions in, in as little as 12 months, which is pretty aggressive. Um, obviously there's permitting, and, you know, that's assuming the permitting and everything else is all is all done. Um, and um, yeah, and then the bonus menus, you know, uh, if, if there's political hot buttons such as homelessness or, or other issues in a community, uh, we can actually um, uh, deal with that um, um, ourselves and, and not really charge the community uh, to, um, uh, you know, for that asset. Um, and, uh, and our get it done attitude, uh, you know, it, uh, we've always, you know, our team's awesome on, on, on that front, always have been, um, you know, we're, we're out there to save the world and, and, uh, and that's the type of people that we attract and, um, and, uh, and really to make it better, right? It's just not about saving the environment or, or, you know, lowering costs or making society better, but it's also the species that are going extinct every day that we, uh, that they don't have a say in the matter. And that's why that's been integrate, uh, in, uh, integrated into everything I've done for the last 30 years. Um, and then the additional revenue streams for the, the, for the bus operators, right? And, and the cities and the taxpayers, um, things that uh, they might not normally uh, get on, on, on um, you know, presently um, or with other options. Um, okay. So yeah. there we go. And uh, there's the final, the final screenshot of everyone. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. A, a lot to digest in there. I love the last bit was uh, transit's going to save the world. And I think that's the theme we have to look at is a lot of, uh, a lot of transit buses out there that, uh, that need to be electrified and zero emission and, and that will save the, uh, save the, um, the climate concerns we have. If you read uh, um, Bill Gates' latest book, he talks about it. Um, really quickly, Kent, I want to ask you a question uh, with respect to carbon you know, being not neutral, but net negative, and how carbon plunk, you mentioned that, how that works with municipalities, because we, we all know it's not, it's not the neutral side. We, we, need to get, we need to decrease our carbon. So maybe you could just focus a little bit on that like, really quickly, a short Two minute answer on that, please. Sure. Well, um, um, typically the only time taxpayers get involved with buses or bus barn facilities is when when they see the big ticket number and they're trying to get it passed through council, and then they then they freak out. But they really don't have an experience with it. Most of them haven't been on a bus for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, you know, if uh, so, what we're trying to do is bring an experience to cities, um, uh, and not just in Ontario or uh, which is my home province originally. I had to come out to Saskatchewan to to implement a bunch more pilots to prove that other things could be done. Um, like zero emission manufacturing, processing, zero emission food production, zero emission value chains, and zero emission transportation, um, and and a few other things. But uh, but ultimately, you know, we need to uh, to if we don't manage our cities properly, we will they, they they will not be sustainable economically, and people will be moving out of the cities. So we need to not only make them more economically sustainable, but we need to empower society and, and lower policing costs, and you know this sort of thing. Like really, really uh, jazz jazz these cities up. It's just not about um, you know economics versus environment. It's really um, really a turnkey solution that we need to implement on 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 a lot of fronts in cities. And so the idea with the um, uh, with the um, uh, the plunk program is to simply uh, measure the carbon emissions that we have that we're producing in the cities and uh, and then offset that uh, directly uh, to our sites off uh, or out of, out of city uh, where we are actually uh, planting um, you know hybrid trees um, uh, biodiversity uh, plants and, and and native trees um, and really focusing on the species um, and um, and and. Um, you know, the species are at risk, like the monarch butterflies need milkweed. Well, then we have milkweed, right? So, you know, it's all these little things that do need to be um, brought forward. And, and the advantage of the hybrid trees is they, they absorb carbon way faster than the native trees, but uh, there's disadvantages on the biodiversity. So, so it's a, it's a blend. Um, but to be able to not only, you know, decarbonize their cities that way, um, uh, but to allow them to come out and experience those sites and uh, see the bird, you know, listen to the birds and, you know, go skiing and, you know, that sort of thing. So that's really what, what, what it's about is to, to solve climate change while we save money and we, 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 
you know, build communities, right? And, and, um, and, you know, we talk about communities, but ultimately a lot of people don't know their neighbors. And that's really what this is about is to really just blow people's minds and show them what's possible. All right, that's great. Um, Teresa, uh, what advice do you have for transits uh, and the first, you know, looking to do this uh, on, their, on their journey to, to electrification? Thanks, Ted. I mean, my mind's still kind of blown by Ken's presentation. I have to, mm -hmm. I have to settle down my neurons a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I tried to lighten it up because uh, Ted said I had 15 minutes and it's just like, okay, then this is going to get really, really light. So um, I'm glad that it still uh, um, uh, in inspired you. It definitely. And I think the about the, the topic about communities is, is really, really key. Um, and, and I think that's all, even COVID has brought that home even more, right? That isolation and, and people really longing and needing to be connected um, and transit plays a really vital. I grew up on transit um, and I, I think it's, it's just a critical part of our, of our communities and, and empowering and making people safe as well. Um, so, so yes, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm with you on that one. Thank you. Um, so yeah, top advice. Uh, well, number one, I think it's you involve the local utility and a, you know, a, a manufacturer or, you know, equipment providers who know bus, and charger infrastructure. I think there's a lot of like, okay, I'm going to just talk to the bus. Okay, that's good. But what are they an expert in this? I, I don't think so. So what about all of the rest of the charging infrastructure? I think you, you need a, a, a someone with experience with that and the utility because they're going to be the one bringing you the interconnect. And, and I also just want to emphasize that that interconnection can take a lot of time, may or may not, depending. Like we don't, depends on your site. And there's going to be a cost that cost is not necessarily gonna be socialized to the, to the rate payer. You, you, you probably will bear that on your own business case. So it's very important to get those numbers as quickly as possible. And there might be quite a long process for the utility to give, I mean, Dan can comment more because I'm not, I'm not close enough to that, but I think that's a very important um, variable in the business case. And that determines so much about your, um, your DER strategy, right? Like your microgrid strategy to understand what is the availability of the power in, in, in my local grid and what's the cost going to be, right? And, then, and not to mention power, you know, power quality and all those nice things that when you dig into the detail of power, you, you get into. Um, so partnering with a utility and, and a manufacturer of charging infrastructure. And then, um, and then I think it's just get coming together to create expertise. And I, I just, I would just love to hear Transit's reaction to that. Like, is that unrealistic or is that realistic? Like, can transit agencies, smaller transit agencies, create joint structures um, to, to share expertise, either like temporary or more, more long-term? Uh, because you know, there's gonna be a nucleus of people who understand and they need to kind of be together and then spread and spread and spread and spread from that. It's sort of like the corporate innovation groups, right? You need to kind of protect them, insulate them and then let them slowly like grow out from there. So. Um, yeah, those are kind of my those are my initial thoughts on that. Yeah, comment on on the, the TPI group they have it, which is the MetroLinks have are working where they're they're writing specifications for vehicles. They're trying to work together to to procure electric vehicles. There's one coming up. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. And look at BC Transit uh, as probably one of the only companies that buys um, the same bus for different different uh, municipalities, which is which is great. They're they're working together. Um, to to go back to that question for Daniel. It was, uh, you know, what are, what are the first steps to type, to type to do this as well? And also, there was a question from the field too for Daniel that, that was, uh, you know, do your chargers that you've had in, have installed are they uh, vehicle to grid? Because that seems to be a big question coming up to everybody. Can can we charge? Go back to the utility, give the power back, as well as use it for energy storage if it's not being uh, used that day. So, please, Daniel. Sure, maybe I can kind of wrap a couple points in uh, there together. So uh, first off, I would like to echo uh, what Teresa was just saying about reaching out early because um, what it does is it buys you time uh, because we don't know until we really understand what the situation is, what actual work is required. You know, there's there's feeders out there, there's loads changing all the time. You know, when you put your request in, you know, that's, that's where in that investigation will really uh, take place in a detailed way. And it could be that it's a, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a small project or, you know, that 
or a small amount of work that needs to be done to, to make that a reality, in which case, you know, then you've got the time and you've got the assurance that nothing more is required. But if there is anything that needs to get done, you know, maybe that, that feature is constrained and, and so some additional support is going to be required or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, you know, maybe it's going to look like, uh, you know, maybe it turns out there's some reliability issues on that feature and, and maybe some on-site storage is going to be a, a beneficial thing. You know, all those things are going to take time to do the modeling and to understand what, um, what the solution ultimately needs to look like. And those things all take time and there's a, um, you know, there's a, the do a dollar impact on those things as well. Um, so with more time, you can make a better decision. So I just wanted to kind of echo that, uh, that part. It, um, I, I know that we don't want to be, um, the barriers to projects moving forward. And I know sometimes that is the case. And sometimes just because we get approached at the last minute uh, and it turns out, you know, it's a, a major expansion that's required to be able to serve a load. I know, you know, some of these, these projects, you know, could be 20 megawatts uh, and that, that's a huge project. Um, so that's, that, that takes time to actually build that electrical infrastructure to, to bring that forward. That's great. Um, we're gonna ask, uh, we're gonna ask Frederick a question and then um, we can open up if you want to raise your hand the, the just reactions at the bottom and ask a question if you'd like. Um, so yeah, uh, Frederick, when you look at the private equity and investment into public transit, what, what type of barrier do you see? And is there, is there uh, you know, how can we overcome that barrier to allow for more private equity into public transit infrastructure, specifically buildings or, or charging, or even, even the buses that could be owned and potentially leased to, this, to the municipalities? Yeah, actually, um, this, uh, this, I don't see really uh, significant barriers. The, 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 this, is what, this is already what we do uh, for a private, in the private sector, uh, making sure we, we, we spread, we, we distribute the cost, the upfront cost of electrification up to uh, the, the, the operations. And you, you see that I've been mentioning the Canadian, uh, the Canada Bank, uh, infrastructure bank and uh, Basically, that, that's exactly what we intend to do. We are really aiming at uh, to, to, to mobilize uh, uh, the different financing options and, and, and private equity to, to invest in vehicles and chargers. And, and as they explained, uh, at, at similar cost to what you're spending on your fleet today. So um, I, don't, I don't really see any hurdle, any, any, any problem doing that. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, what we the second thing we bring there is this financial topic of course but uh, uh, I think we heard a lot today about how we need several different kind of expertise there is the expertise on the energy services the, the expertise on the vehicles the expertise on on the charging of course and on the digitalization of, of, of services that's really where we, we 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 bring also this expertise to break the silos you know when you when we, you're running in in, in silos, uh, you, you, you don't manage well the, the, the complexity, and that's really what we want to bring to, to, the, OT, to the operators, uh, bring this uh, bridge, the different expertise, and, 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 and deliver a, a solution that would really make sense. That's great. Um, I've got one question from Fielder from Doug Parker. Again, I think he's the only one that can type in all this. So uh, Doug from my IBI group has asked, Kent, how do you uh, intend to charge your, your uh, overhead uh, in your structure that you have proposed? Charge uh, overhead? Yeah, overhead. Is it attached to mezzanine or that's how? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So the second, the second level, I didn't, I didn't, well, you saw, you saw the second level in, in, in some of the images in regards to the options, uh, the bonus features, but, uh, but yeah, that's exactly right. There's um, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, mounted right to the ceiling. Okay. And the chargers are mounted right to the ceiling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. So we, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free either, either way, or we can we can cut 10 minutes early because I have to make my lunch before our GR meeting with the EMC. So uh, it's up to everybody. Uh, I, I, I certainly, I thank uh, Opta for allowing us to do this. First of all, it, it truly is a great trade organization that CUDA, Opta, and even Opta in the US. So we, uh, we are really lucky to be part of this, this group and the community of, of transit um, and I, I can't say it enough. We have the opportunity to, to do so much with transit and with buses. Um, my, it's, it, my family's been in it for a long time and it's just a great uh, industry to be in. Miss everybody out there because we, we can't see each other because of the events, but look forward to the next uh, Opta and CUDA events and uh, just seeing everybody is gonna be, gonna be great again. So with that said, if any closing statements, please, uh, Teresa, you can start. 
Thanks, Ted, for including me. And no, let's. Uh, I, I look forward to your feedback on any of these questions and anything that we can also we can do. And um, look forward to the next projects. Frederick. It was a pleasure to 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 be here uh, to and and uh, hope to um, really support uh, all your electrification initiatives. And thank you, Ted, for the invitation today. You're welcome. And then Daniel. Yeah, really enjoyed the opportunity uh, to speak with everyone today and to be on a, a panel with such esteemed uh, speakers. Thank Great. you. And Kent, you have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, thank you very much, Ted. Uh, yeah, and um, I do appreciate you and uh, and everyone else um, uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss, uh, you know, what I think will be a really amazing Canadian solution that will be uh, released uh, internationally here shortly. Um, you know, and we do have, um, um, you know, reps uh, already positioned around the world ready to release. And uh, so it's just not going to be um, um, you know, out of my garage launch, which is which is great. Um, and um, but yeah, so basically, you know, if um, you know, I, I really want to I really want to make sure that that people realize that transit can be awesome. And uh, I'd love to see, uh, uh, you know, people that haven't been on the bus for 30 or 40 years um, get excited to actually, you know, get down there for the first time and try it out, you know, and see what this is all about. And, and for cities where it's okay to actually invite the public to, to the new facilities where, where they're okay with the public coming in there, um, then, uh, then that's great, but they don't need to do that. Right. And, uh, you know, we can provide a bus burn solution for, um, um, for, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, we can we can keep it really simple, and we can we can blow people's minds, and uh, and and I just really want to ideally blow people's minds. The more we blow them, the more that we can lower property taxes or hold property taxes, and really make a difference to families. I'll say this: can yeah. you mention the hockey rink above? No, I say we, it's got to be lacrosse. We'll stick with lacrosse. <laughs> easier to uh, maintain. Right, yeah. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Jed's actually uh, in uh, uh, um, 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 in the. I muted him. <laughs> Karen, Karen, go ahead, Karen. <laughs> well, thank you to everyone. Thank you to uh, Ted and BYD for sponsoring this uh, event today. We had a, a lot of interest. And for those uh, who are on the, the webinar today who would like to share this with your colleagues and uh, share it beyond that community, uh, the, the webinar will be available on the Opta website on demand. Uh, we'll send a, a link out to everyone. And thank you again for your interest. Take care, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>